Zeus and Prometheus is another story I love because it's a story of a human upgrade that you can find in ancestral narratives all around the world. It echoes the Sumerian story of the conflict between Enlil and Enki. So as Zeus is the senior, Prometheus is the leader in the second chair, to use that analogy. Well, Enlil is the leader, Enki is the number two. It echoes the Yahweh and serpent story from the biblical narrative. They all talk about a moment of upgrade, upgrading the consciousness and intelligence. Prometheus is upgrading humanity to a technological species with specific technology, whether that's fire or some people read that as firepower. And Zeus thinks this is an idiotic decision and uh, feels Prometheus was totally out of order and had uh, broken rank to have done such a stupid thing. Were well, these conversations and conflicts absolutely echo in the Enlil, Enki, Yahweh and the Serpent stories. And then the notes that accompany the story are the same as well, because with the upgrade in all these versions of the story comes the sexualization of humanity. And now we have humanity made male and female. Now we have humanity made fertile. And now we have the introduction of sickness and death. It's all there in the Greek telling and Sumerian and biblical. You can find it in the Nigerian telling of the story. The Efik people tell the story of Abasi and Atai. And you'll find Pandora's box in the Nigerian telling of the story. Pandora's box is Abasi and Atai's device for managing the upgraded humanity. Uh, kind of a punishment for being too capable, too technological, and too clever. Now, as I said at the outset, I am an absolute beginner in Greek mythology, but it's parallels like these that really catch my attention and make me want to return to Greek stories with an eye to many layers, not expect to find that they are stories of a single layer and to ask different questions than I may have asked in school. There is more than one way to listen to these ancient stories. And I think it's helpful not to speak of Greek myths, but of Greek wisdom. And as I explore Greek wisdom, like Heinrich Schliemann, I will expect to learn about geopolitics, ancient and modern, like uh, Aristarchus and Anaximander, I will expect to find cosmology. Like Flavius Josephus, I will expect to learn about history and human origins. And like Plato, and Socrates and Pythagoras, I will expect my experience of present reality and my very level of consciousness to be transformed by what I find in ancient Greece. And I'll pause there. Back to you, Neil. Hey, brother. Sorry, I was getting some water. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. If anybody has any questions, please do. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. I haven't been watching the clock very closely, so I hope we're more or less on schedule at this point. No, you're good. You have quite a lot of time left. So I well, that did, allows um, us to have a conversation, which I was hoping for. Exactly. So I had a couple of comments, and if anybody has any comments or questions, or things you want us to talk deeper about, please go ahead and post in the chat. All right, so in, for me, I, you know when you said, if we're not the first, who are we? If this is the healing work that was done before, who are we? You know, those are really profound philosophical questions even, right? Like, um, if this has happened before, we're not just evolving linearly, and now we're able to like expand, but we've done this before, what does this really mean? Is, is that kind of what you're referring to there? You want to elaborate on that? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, when I went to school, I was given the impression that humanity had been evolving like this, 
you know, gradually getting cleverer and cleverer and cleverer. And the meta narrative is ancestors stupid, us clever. And you go to these places and you realize that's not true. And that there has, there has been civilization here before the civilization we know about. And as soon as you see evidence for uh, one pivot in world history that way, it opens up the question of how many pivots have there been? And of course, Plato suggested there had been many, but then it alters your relationship with what we do know from the ancient past, because instead of reading classics you know, to write essays, <laughs> you start reading classics to learn, to recover ancient wisdom. And if we want to progress, for instance, in our understanding, um, let's talk about energy heating, sound heating. I mean, this, you can find iterations of this in our alternative health scene, but you can also find it in scientific hospitals where we're learning to use light to heal. If we can realize that by doing this, we are recovering knowledge that was there in the deep past, then of course we will relate to our ancestors differently. Of course we will read Pythagoras differently. Uh, and as I hinted, there have been periods where we didn't have the knowledge to give Pythagoras the respect he deserved. And you brought that out beautifully in, in your presentation. We didn't have the knowledge to give Plato the respect he deserved. Now we know enough we should know to go back and listen with a more open ear and say, well, what did they know about these things? And so the idea of our evolution, our development, isn't this you know, movement into the future. It has to be a movement into the past as well. And I think uh, that's what I mean about being humbled and asking, who are we? Because we are learners. We are learners and we have seniors and elders and ancestors to learn from. And if we listen to uh, great site Plato, we have helpers to help us in that learning as well. So I think there's a whole um, multifaceted journey of discovery and ascension that becomes possible if you're willing to be humbled, even by the megalithic record of our planet in that way. And many people, who go to these places like I did as a tourist, come home very pensive and thoughtful for exactly those reasons. Right, you mean like they visit the place and then they see the, the epicness, if you will, and of what they've created and start maybe questioning the ancient narrative of them being primitive, right, compared to us now? That's right, but also with an appetite to recover lost wisdom. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said here also that there've been many pivots, right? And when you say that, I think about the yuga cycles. You're familiar with the yuga cycles, right? Cycles of time, the evolution, the devolution of consciousness, um, and the whole concept that we're going through an evolution right now. So it's almost like many pivots could seem like there've been many cycles and we don't really even know how many cycles there are. If we're just looking at, you know, say the last 13,000 years ago, right? And us being maybe at a golden age 13,000 years ago. And even that is like barely provable at this point. We're just getting to proving that, right? There could have been so many more advanced civilizations that existed before that, that we may never even be able to get opportunity to find out probably, you know, True. what happened. True, I mean, I mean, if you discover there was a civilization before, uh, probably the first thing you're going to want to know is how did they get destroyed? Because we don't want to. What's the lesson we need to learn yes. from this ancient story? But then when you take it to another level and relate it to yuga cycles, you ask on another level, well, what is the syllabus for this cycle? <clears throat> what are we supposed to learn this time around? What is it mm -hmm. we have to do to get to a golden age? And mm -hmm. it's interesting, with all the turbulence of the last couple of years, I think, has put that question to a lot of people in society at large. We can see the push and pull of uh, governing dynamics around the planet. And I think a lot of people are asking, how can we avoid going down what looks like a very dark track? How can we flip it the other way so that we actually learn what we're supposed to learn so that we can achieve a golden age, so that we can have a better human experience? And I, 
I'm not an expert in the yuga cycles, but I think I would like to learn more about that because I want to know what's the syllabus? <laughs> what are we supposed to be learning this time around? Mm -hmm. It's not just a question of survival. Mm -hmm. It's a yes. matter of can we be the best iteration of humanity that's possible? Yes. You know, uh, the whole thing of the reason why I explore the ancient past so much, um, you know, a lot of some people within, you know, that come to our events are really into more of the spiritual understanding rather than the historic understanding. And um, I've also had the question of like, you know, why exploring so much about the past is about empowering the present and being in the now. But you really uh, outlined it here. We have this arrogance that has been collectively adopted by even spiritual people that we are the most advanced that we've ever been. And um, yes. but when we look at the ancient past and we see that you know, technology and consciousness did, don't have to raise at the same time, they're definitely technologically advanced cultures in the past, probably, you know, from your research and many others, we see this. But then also there were higher levels of consciousness communities that maybe didn't need computers and different things like that. And they did get destroyed. So the what we can learn from our ancient past is not only um, hidden truths about who we are and the nature of reality, but also how to avoid these cycles of time so that we don't have to restart all over again. You know, we can continue evolving. Yes, that's right. I think that's uh, kind of what makes the, um, the contemporary myth of Wakanda so mm -hmm. resonant. <laughs> the idea yeah. that you could have higher consciousness and the technology to preserve right. that wisdom and to preserve that tradition and not be the very conscious indigenous people who get conquered by the people who've got higher tech, but aren't very bright socially, which has sort of been world history. And uh, I, I love the way the Wakanda story puts a question mark over all of that and saying, wouldn't it be great if uh, consciousness was not trumped by technology? And wouldn't it be great if there really were a thriving indigenous tradition that we can sit at the feet of and learn from? Well, the fact is our indigenous traditions, even though we've done our level best to extinguish them over the last couple of thousands of years, they have survived and much of their wisdom has survived. And I think part of the humbling that I think many of us need is to go back to uh, sources that we've dis dismissed in the past because they were the losers uh, of history and say, no, actually, they're the carriers of the wisdom that, that we need. If I'm suddenly realizing that what I'm learning at school and off the TV is not scratching where it's itching, is not giving me the information and the empowerment that I need, where will I go? Well, you go to the narratives that have survived at the grassroots. You go to the indigenous traditions that have persisted through history and carried the kind of information that I've referred to and that's echoed yeah. in, in the Greek legends as well. You know, sometimes these stories survive uh, as the Greek uh, myths have, but they are sidelined because we're taught to regard them in a particular way. And uh, that's a more subtle way of uh, conquering and sidelining previous wisdom of previous cultures mm -hmm. and again that's sort of what i was hinting at can we go back to these stories and ask yeah. a fresh layer of questions and in your in this book or is it your next book coming out where you're going to have more in, um, stories from indigenous because you've done this yourself you, you do this research not just um you know when it comes to biblical truth but worldwide indigenous communities yes that's what i do in echoes of eden really uh, go back to those sources and just see what it is that's being offered. Because I think when in the past, uh, conquering powers uh, suppressed indigenous story, it wasn't just because they didn't like our ancestors' stories about ETs. Um, I think what they were really worried about was the narratives and protocols that relate to the empowerment of human society. You know, conquering mm. powers want to govern society. They don't want empowered society. That's the very opposite right. of what you want when you conquer. And so it's sort of a smoking gun. The history of conquests and imperial invasions is a smoking gun literally around the world saying, you go and look at what they try to suppress because it is all about 
empowering mm. human beings for a, a better, more conscious human experience. And that's what Echoes of Eden is really all about. Right. So in regards to Greek culture and, and Minoans, right, Minoans heavily influenced Greek culture, but there were other tribes also that kind of merged with Minoans during the time of the Trojans. Do you know at all um, the range of, was there a tribe before that? Are you aware of anything before the Minoans? Do you know how many thousands of years Greek culture was like, you know, flourishing oh, in that area? That's, no, I don't, but I'm really fascinated by that because of yeah. hints in some of the story that uh, really would appear to be thousands, if not tens of thousands of years old. And so some of the cosmic information uh, hints at the story of our solar system, for instance, it references right. to the arrival of the moon, for instance, and the people who were here before the moon arrived. That's that's there in in the in the wider Greek corpus. So uh, no, I don't. But I would love to probe that because it goes back a whole lot further than we think it does, and the information has survived a lot longer than we think it has. Mm -hmm. You know, there's um. There's a university called um, Ananda University. Have you heard of it? No. Okay, so based out of uh, their, their followers of Yogananda, right? But they're like, it's not dogmatic to the point where it's just Yogananda. It's like a couple of disciples after him and then also Yogananda's um, teacher. So basically they have like communities all over the US and um, they're huge into yoga cycle information. So I just got certified yoga cycle teacher training from them so i'm i just got certified in advanced yoga, yoga cycle training because i was just All it right. was my covid project you know i am and, coming um, to your first seminar then. <laughs> oh i'm putting together one just on yoga cycles for three hours so i'll let you know oh, about wonderful. it but Thank you. what they do is they take people to greece once a year to show uh, ancient greece over thousands of years to show how the consciousness devolved and evolved over the yoga cycles you know so i thought that was very oh, interesting. Right. They specifically have scholars dedicated to yoga cycle awareness of Greece, and that's who they fly out there to. So it's interesting because it goes to your point that they've been around for thousands of years and the culture and the culture, obviously, through thousands of years went di through different cycles of, you know, forgetfulness, remembering all that. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the forgetfulness. Um, I, I just mentioned this. Uh, and this is information I have not not from Greek mythology, but from Aboriginal Australian uh, story. And that is that the forgetting of what has gone before uh, is not um, it's not an accident. And it's not just the product of empires canceling out the culture that they've conquered that when you listen to elders of um, traditional cultures, indigenous traditions, there is the sense that we're not allowed to speak of the civilization that was here before. Mm. And uh, whether that is to protect humanity from traumatization, or whether it's because the learning exercise actually requires that, I'm not sure, but I'm just intrigued that there is this other layer to the forgetting that operates at a much higher level than the political level that I was just talking about. Yeah, and that's interesting because that sounds like, um, you know, in Egypt, for example, there's so much evidence pointing it to be like at least 12,000 years old, the Sphinx. And a lot of people say that the fall of Atlantis happened at the Younger Dryas period, the end of the last ice age, same time. And that Egypt was basically a creation of Atlantis, like a an um, offset of it, right? And yes. even Thoth was known as Thoth the Atlantean. But when you go and look in ancient Egyptian scripture, you have all this advanced awareness that they say came from somewhere, but there's no real talk about exactly where it came from. No, that's right. I mean, I remember when I was in Egypt and I went to the Giza Plain and we had fascinating conversations with the guides and... Um, whenever we came to something that was really really advanced it was oh well that's pre-dynastic egypt we don't know much about that and it was just so interesting that this phrase pre-dynastic was almost seen as a we don't have to explain <laughs> once we've used that phrase pre-dynastic egypt 
that were well, they were very very clever <laughs> but we never quite got to well who were they who were they because if we study history in a conventional sense before um the pyramids as they have been dated all you've got is farming you mm -hmm. don't go from farming to building pyramids and then you've got this mystery pre-dynastic egypt that's more advanced but what i love is that the guides are often very frank and very straightforward uh sometimes they'll say which answer would you like <laughs> and, and you can take your choice but i think that what you were just saying about the timing uh, i agree with that about um putting the the uh, pyramids in that period that is closed by the younger dryas cold period and the cataclysms associated with it so you've got massive flooding at the beginning of that period and at the end of it and of course it is the the flood damage that i think is the real smoking gun pointing to the much much older age of the giza plain than mm -hmm. you or i were taught at school Thank you.